It's September 13th, 2014, and you're listening to episode 3 of The Road to Japan. Episode of the Road to Japan. My name is Nico. I'll be your host for this episode. Um, what are we gonna What are we gonna talk about today? Well, as I mentioned uh, last time, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, my work history, which probably doesn't sound very exciting, but hopefully it will help uh, you, the audience, kind of get a an understanding of what what currently motivates me to do what I'm doing um, in terms of this show, in terms of going to college and trying to seek basically a, you know, a more improved life. Um, but first let's talk about some, some updates. There's, uh, you know, been some, some things that have gone on that have, uh, uh, changed in, well, it's, it's been a week. Um, so it's, it's, uh, the 13th of September. It's, it's a nice, lovely Saturday evening. Um, basically what happened this week that was probably pretty big was the fact that, I actually changed my uh, history class. Um, as I mentioned, I have uh, history, psychology, math, which is algebra, and uh, English course uh, for this semester. And originally, psychology and history were being taken uh, via online courses, so I didn't have to actually go to a classroom. Uh, originally, that was because that's what fit into my schedule with the travel that I was willing to do. Um, but it turns out that the, <laughs> that the teacher on the online history course is kind of a douche. Um, maybe that's not the best way to put it, but uh, yeah, he didn't seem like the uh, friendliest person. Let's just, let's just put it that way. Uh, uh, basically before or just after our first week's assignment was due, he sent us all an email uh, just barking threats and not really doing any actual teaching. It was basically just him saying, reread this stuff that I posted that obviously wasn't very clearly written because everyone was getting it wrong. Um, and so, you know, means as I, once I read that, I just kind of decided, okay, this guy's obviously not interested in teaching us. I don't, I don't know what it is uh, about, the online curriculum, because I kind of get the same vibe from my psychology teacher, but I'm willing to kind of deal with it because, I mean, the coursework is not as involved with the other students as it was in history because I had to go onto a forum and interact and reply to other people's posts about the subject being discussed and so on and so forth. Um, thankfully, that's not the case in in the uh, psychology class. It's pretty, pretty much I can just do all the work on my own and progress at my own pace and things of that nature. So um, because the history teacher was acting the way he was, I decided I'm not going to let this guy get in the way of me achieving a good grade for the class. Um, it just seemed like he was going to be throwing roadblocks in, in my way as far as uh, one to prove that I was reading the material and whatnot. And I mean, Here's the thing. I'm not doing the same thing in my psychology class. I'm basically taking tests and exams and things like that, which is also pre proving that I'm reading the material because if anything, I have to go read the material to find the right answer for whatever question. Um, but yeah, this history teacher was not really doing, doing, I feel, an effective job of teaching me coursework. He pretty much just wanted to say, read this crap and do, you know, do this forum stuff. And if I don't see certain guidelines being met, then I'm going to fail you. And that doesn't really work for me. Um, so <laughs> ultimately what I'm getting at, even though I've been berating on for se several minutes about this already, um, is that I transferred out of his course. I dropped his history class and decided to get into a classroom. The only issue, the, the slight issue that I have with it is the fact that this classroom is on the other side of town, which is, kind of a pain in the ass, but 
I mean, it was either that or suffer through this online course that was, you know, very slowly making me miserable. Um, so I did that and it's going to cost me a little extra money in, in tuition because I still have to pay a portion for that online course that I was enrolled in. Um, cause I think it's like one to 12 days or something like, at least this is how my school works. Your school may work differently. Um, but, uh, so, so we had, I had to pay a portion of that uh, for that class. And then I still have to pay the full price for this new class that I'm in. So my tuition bill went up like, I, I think like $120 or something like that, which I mean, ultimately it's just money. I mean, I, I know I sound kind of weird saying that, but, uh, you know, I'm not letting anything get in the way of my, of my college progress here, which speaking of that, I want to just make a kind of a quick note in regards to, you know, this, sh this show, I suppose, and pretty much all everything that I'm doing. Um, I'm doing this because this is very important to me. The, the whole getting through college, improving what I consider to be improving my life is going to be of the utmost importance to me for the next few years. And I hope that if, if you're listening to this, then that's a similar goal. It doesn't have to be exactly what I'm doing. Um, but you know, regardless of what it, what it, your goal may be, it may be to, to get a better job, to get a house, you know, to have a family, what, whatever it is. Um, this show should be able to tell you that regardless of where you're at, that you can still achieve and accomplish the, the goals that you want to, you know, get through. Um, and the reason I'm saying this is because I threw up something on social medias, uh, you know, on, on my personal account and, and someone immediately said, Oh, you're, you just like talking about yourself, which I mean, yes, if you're reading it, that, that is what it looks like, but I'm also doing it so that, you know, I can look at that later and say, look at what I'm doing. Cause you know, I, I talked about how I got ahead in my psychology course. I'm good for homework up up past next week, which I think is awesome. And I wanted to share that because I think other people will find that awesome as well. And sure, it is probably a little bit of bragging. Um, but the thing is, is that this is, this is the kind of stuff that's going to allow me to keep going, to keep working towards my goals, you know, because I feel if I don't do that, then with nobody, you know, holding me accountable, including myself, then that's what could start leading to failure. I did the same thing last semester when I had just my two courses, but it was the fact that my friends, you know, that I may not see, be able to see in person were able to kind of cheer me on. And I felt that was important. So yeah, I'm going to throw up things on social media every now and then talking about how, you know, hopefully how well I'm doing. Um, and I'm going to do the same thing on this show uh, because that's, you know, that's what I, that's what I want to do. Um, I hope that someday I'll be able to do a show where I'm saying, Hey, I did it. I, I got through all of this and you, I mean, obviously the nature of the show is getting to Japan. So hopefully I'll be getting to that show where I say, I did it. I'm going to Japan and I'm going to go live there and do a job. And I mean, all this other, you know, the what will end up being years worth of hard work and effort will finally pay off and i mean you just got to take those little steps along the way to say hey i'm i'm doing it you know i mean i guess you can wait till graduation day but i think i think not a lot of times people well i think people do explain the difficulties which I mean, it's fine. You know, if you're struggling, maybe there's something that a, a friend can do to help out. Um, I just want to, at least for now, you know, note that things are going well for me. Um, because I also have, you know, at least in my history, I have naysayers. Uh, I have people that, that I even called friends at one point that didn't believe and maybe even still don't believe that I'm going to do these things. And it's just as important to prove to them that I am doing it. Um, so, you know, these semi, I don't know, weekly or month, monthly updates as to how things are going are, are uh, going to kind of 
put them in their place. I mean, so to speak. And, you know, if you're setting a goal kind of like this, or, you know, as I mentioned, it could be any other type of goal, you you also should be putting out progress updates and letting letting those out there know that you're accomplishing those goals. So, you know, that's that's my that's my little my little kind of mini rant on on uh throwing out updates and whatnot. So uh getting getting back to you know the actual show here. Um I did have my first test in my math class and I'd say it went pretty well. I won't find out till uh probably next week sometime. But uh I feel pretty good about it. Um and yeah, aside from the history thing, that's pretty much all the uh, the updates that's been going on. Um, so now let's kind of get into the to the meat of the show, shall we? Um, we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about my work history and what's kind of helped to bring me to where where I'm at right now. Um, and I feel I feel there are probably those of you out there, I mean, obviously my audience, audience is probably pretty small at this point, if if I have any at all. Um, but I feel for those of you that are maybe catching up or whatever, that you may be in a similar situation. So that's why I want to talk about this for the for today's episode is, is so that I can start to get on relatable levels with other audience members. And hopefully, you know, over time, people will start to uh, write in or call in or tweet or do whatever uh, to get in touch with the show to be able to share their stories. Because as I mentioned before, this isn't all about me. I mean, sure, I'm going to, you know, kind of make myself the subject of progressing towards my goals. But I want this to also kind of turn into a not like, kind of maybe like a support group of sorts. Um, but it's just, you know, like I have learned as I will be talking about with my work history, I've learned the importance of going to college and why if you have the opportunity to do so that you should. And the thing is, is that I've met a lot of people over the years that will, that have had great golden opportunities to go to school and they don't. And they just kind of, or, or sometimes they say like, well, uh, I'm not going to worry about that right now which I can understand if you don't want to do it right away. Um, I'm actually glad sort of that I waited. Well, I didn't wait on purpose, but um, I mean, just the way the circumstances laid out, I'm glad that at least there was a few years for me to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, so that when I finally did get started, I at least had an idea of what direction I wanted to go. Cause I think that's part of the problem with, a student, a high school student getting ready to graduate and all they're seeing is just a bunch of colleges or universities saying, hey, you should come here because we want your money more than that other college over there, which I, that's how I feel. I mean, you can say what you want, but in the end, universities and colleges are out to make money just like any other business. Um, whether or not, you know, they're really in it to get you educated is questionable because I mean, the moment you stop giving them money, they stop educating you. So, you know, there's the debate there. Um, but I'm not going to get into that. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, like when I, when I hear something like, like I, there, there was this kid I know, um, and he, he was talking about how he got like a free ride or got offered at least a free ride from his parents to go to school. And he decided not to do that because he wanted to pursue like blogging or something to which, I mean, that's fine. If that's what you want to do, great. Why can't you blog and be in school at the same time? I mean, the kid was only working like a part time at Kmart or some, some crap like that. Um, but it, it's like, why can't you try and accomplish that while also getting an education? Cause at the very least you can be at the end of three or four years and say, well, at least I have a degree whether or not you actually accomplish anything with your, uh, you know, your blogging, writing stuff, whatever that may be. So, I mean, that it just, it's just hearing things like that that just really drive me crazy. And, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's because of the fact that I have to, um, you know, put in a lot of effort and definitely a lot of money to a accomplish the same goal that that kid could have gotten, you know, for free. Um, 
but I mean, I guess in, in a similar or in a, in a different context, you know, I'm glad that I am working hard to, to do this. Cause I mean, when, you know, when it's, when it's on your time and your dime, it's, uh, it's going to be a hell of a lot more important to you. So, you know, there's, there's like pros and cons to all the situations that, that I've kind of been discussing here. But, um, anyway, let, let's, let's get past that. I'm just, I'm just kind of rambling here. So, okay, let, we'll get into my work history now. So basically I'll, I'll kind of skim over the beginning. Cause that's, you know, it is what it is. But, uh, when I was in high school, uh, I think like my junior year, I started, uh, with a job that most high school students do, which is a customer service job. Uh, for me in particular, I worked at, uh, Blockbuster Video. Do you guys remember those? I'm pretty sure the the last one closed down not too long ago. I think you might still be able to see them around every now and then, but uh, yeah, probably yeah, probably kids that were born when when I started that job probably don't, wouldn't even know what you're talking about um, when you even say video store. They'll think you're they'll think it's probably another term for Netflix or Amazon Prime or something. But uh, anyway, so that was my. Uh, that was my first job working, working at a video store. Cause I told myself, I told myself when I was a teenager and getting around that age of starting to look for work, um, that I wasn't going to work in fast food. I didn't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to work in the food industry at all. And so far so good. I haven't, I have not, I have yet to serve any person, any kind of food at my, at any of my jobs. Um, unless you count maybe that blockbuster. Cause I did sell like candy, I guess. I don't know if, I don't know if you want to count that. I don't really, but anyway, so that was pretty much what I, the type of work that I did for, uh, definitely while I was in high school and certainly a, a couple of years after I graduated as well. Uh, cause I mean, that's the unfortunate part is unless you start going to college and start earning other, uh, other training, you're pretty much going to be sticking to the fields that you know which for a lot of us is customer service. That's why you see so many customer service people out there. Um, so I did that. I did try venturing into uh, sales for a little while. And I mean, when I say a little while, I'm, I'm talking brief. We're talking maybe months at best. Um, I, did, I did one job that was door to door and that was, that was terrible. That was just utterly terrible. I had to wear... I had to wear a full suit with a jacket and, uh, you know, nice shoes and everything. And I had to walk around a neighborhood for like nine hours a day. And we were selling, we were selling like these, it was like a scratch it. I think I don't even remember what it was. It was like some kind of coupon thing. Um, and it was, it was just terrible. And I'm terrible at sales. Just so you know, I, the, the problem, the problem with, a bad well the problem when it comes to sales is that if you take no for an answer like i do you're going to be a terrible salesman which is why i hate salespeople because they are so incredibly pushy and they will they they will not let you go until you're either ready to punch them in the face or you just give in and buy whatever it is they're selling um so you know most times when i'm walking around a store or something that has those types of workers there and they come by and they say, Hey, how's it going? Uh, just like, I'm not even interested. Don't, don't even talk to me, go find someone else. And I just got to shoo them away immediately, which is kind of irritating. Cause then when I do need help, they're nowhere to be found, which is ironic, but, um, so yeah. Okay. So I did that. And then I also did a, uh, a job a few years later that was kind of like telemarketing because I figure, well, I did, I did door to door in person and that didn't work. Let's see how it works over the phone. Yeah, over the phone is just as bad. The only difference was is that I was paid a salary as opposed to that door to door job where it was strictly commission. So if I didn't make any sales, I didn't get any money at the end of the day. And they they paid daily. Um, I basically had just enough money at the end of the day because I, I did make, I think, a couple pity sales here and there. Um, but I made just enough, just enough money to pretty much purchase my transportation for the next day. Cause I didn't have a car at the time. I was, I was still uh, riding the bus and it was enough to cover like a, a small meal. Cause with, with the amount of traveling 
Because I, I mean, my my commute was an hour and a half both ways just to get to the office, and then there was the ten hour day of you know meetings and going out and actually doing the work, and then lunch and you know coming back. So after after all that, then I had another hour and a half commute back home. So I only had like a handful of hours to actually sleep, you know, get cleaned up, do that kind of stuff. And that was six days a week, which I mean, that's why it, it was only six weeks that I was at that job. And, and the, the last straw for me was I was obviously very uh, disheartened when I was in like the fifth week or whatever, and I was still doing just as bad as I was the first week. And some, and I was starting to obviously show frustration and anger. And one of the ladies that I worked with was just like, you just got to have a happier attitude. And I decided after that, I was, that I was done that I would just, cause I mean, luckily that was the end of the day that she said that. And I was just like, all right, I'm just not coming back tomorrow because it just wasn't worth it. It's not like, you know, what am I going to miss out on a day day's worth of piddly pathetic pay? Yeah. That wasn't for me. I figured I could do better. Um, so, you know, fast forward, then I did telemarketing jobs and I was really bad at that as well, but at least I was getting a salary out of that. So, you know, at least I was still making money regardless of my poor selling ability. But eventually I got let go from that job because, well, they do want you to make sales at some point. Um, but that particular company was kind of shady. Um, they actually ended up closing a couple months after I was let go. And like, it was weird because they just sort of, disappeared you know same same thing with the car dealership that sold me my car that i drive now they're just really shady people but uh anyway so yeah i i was doing customer service sales jobs for i don't know probably the first four or five years um around the time that i was in high school and in my early 20s and then um and then basically i'm just gonna skip to uh when i got into manufacturing so i decided around I don't remember what it was. It was like 2005, I think. I was still, I think I was working in a call center because um, that was the other type of job that I would be able to get usually pretty easily. And I should say, I, I want to make a note here. If you're in college or about to start college and you need a, uh, a decent paying job and you're able to work full-time hours or even part-time hours for that matter, a call center is a great place to look at. Um, because usually they're more than willing to work with college students. Um, they're not to mention they have, depending on where you go, they sometimes have pretty crazy hours anyway. Um, there was the, during the time that I was taking my Japanese courses, I actually was working, uh, I was, I was working full time at a call center and I was, the job was, uh, replenishing time on prepaid phone cards, which, those don't really exist now unless you are getting one to maybe call overseas. But I think even even there's something that you can work in with your cell phone to to alleviate that. But but at, the, at this time, you know, when I was working the job, they, you still had to pay like outrageous fees to call long distance and things like that, just even across the, the country, let alone other countries. Um, so, yeah, that was what our our particular call center did is we, we would, you know, get a call and pretty much just they say oh i want to add this much time or money to my card and then you take care of it and that's it you know very 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 short process usually these calls were 2 minutes or less um but what was great was that uh they did need like a handful of people at this particular company to uh work overnight so um the nice thing about that is that i had uh very few calls well, I should say less calls than when uh, you work during the day uh, or even in the evening, because most of these people that were calling were still within the United States. So uh, pretty much from about nine o'clock Pacific, which is where which is the time zone I was in at the time. I live in Central now, but uh, nine o'clock Pacific was midnight on the East Coast. So that's when the calls started to kind of die down. And as it got later and later, then the other time zones started to get later as well. And then, you know, I mean, you still get some every now and then. Um, and those were the times that usually other people from other countries would call as well. Um, it didn't happen a lot. But anyway, what I'm getting at is that it was a great time because they didn't care what you did in between 
uh, in between calls. Um, they didn't really like you conversing with other people because that was typically a distraction. But, you know, people would usually bring books or magazines or a newspaper or something like that, as long as it didn't make a lot of noise. Um, so I always brought in my homework and I just did my homework while I was waiting for calls. It was great. It was a very efficient way to, uh, you know, take care of any, any business you have and still have, still allow you to have some free time when you weren't at school or at work. Um, it was, it was awesome. The only drawback of course, was that it was in the middle of the night. So your sleep schedule can kind of get screwed up uh, if that's if that's the case um you know to be honest if i was able to manage it somehow i'd work a graveyard shift right now um because then that would mean that my schedule would be open at all times during both mornings and evenings so that i wouldn't have to do this like crazy ass dance to get classes when i want them at the particular campus that i want um but i mean if i end up getting into this accelerate program it's not going to matter anyway because i'm going to be taking all my classes online so anyway let's uh we'll just continue on there so anyway i i, I just want to uh reiterate that if you if you can get a call center job because usually they only require a little bit of uh you know customer service experience and then most places will train you uh some places even do like a like a paid training well usually they're all paid training um they'll get you to you know you clock in and then you're in training for a day or something but uh, they are a great way to uh, have at least a source of income that and it's also doing something that doesn't require you to be like flipping burgers for minimum wage and that's the other thing is that these jobs tend to pay a little better than your typical minimum wage job I mean I think uh, I think all my jobs paid either ten dollars or more per hour which you know and this was this was over 10 years ago. So you can, I, I think I looked up call center jobs just a little while ago. And I think some of them still are upwards of like 14, $15 an hour now. So it might, it might work for you to, to try and look that up. If you're, if you're in need of money and you know, not really making a whole lot where you're at now, I'm just saying it's just an option out there. So, you know, hit up Craigslist or, or what have you just be careful because obviously Craigslist can have a lot of scams on there. Um, so if they're talking about sales, you usually want to avoid that, but there, there are places there that talk about customer service. So those, those should be okay to hit up. Um, so anyway, I was in customer service. I was working at a call center at the time and I was getting tired of customer service. It just was driving me crazy because I don't like to follow the rule that the customer is always right. Um, because I've been, I'm, I mean, I'm obviously a customer plenty of, you know, in my daily life, I'm always a customer at everywhere I go besides work. Um, and I know there've been times where I've been wrong about something being the customer. So the fact that everyone assumes that they're right because they're the customer doesn't always jive with me. Um, that's not to say that I refuse service or anything like that. It just, I like to put re a realistic perspective on things. But anyway, the, the whole customer service, you know, they're always right motto just was really getting to me and I wanted to get out of it. So my friend at the time was telling me that there, that he was working a job in, in manufacturing. And obviously you don't have to deal with customers. You just go in there, you do the, do your work and go home. Um, and that sounded awesome to me. I was like, well, great. What, where do I sign? You know? Um, so I got my first, uh, manufacturing job, which actually was a pay cut from the call center job. That's how pissed off I was. And actually I'll be talking about, um, I'll actually be talking about that a little bit later in this episode as well, when I get to, uh, get back to kind of discussing the goals and everything. But, uh, yeah, this was like a $2 pay cut to go from the call center job I was doing to this manufacturing job. And I took it happily. Um, it was, I mean, that's just how much customer service was pissing me off. So I got this job at, uh, working, working at a, a saw chain manufacturer and I pretty much just packaged up the saw chain. I'm not going to go into detail about it. Cause it's, I mean, the place doesn't even exist anymore. Um, they got, they got closed down a few years ago, at least last I heard. Um, but but the job was, you know, it, it was what it was. It was a fine. Um, but uh, I had an issue with uh, one of the supervisors there and eventually started looking elsewhere for 
for work. And this is where, uh, this is the point where I transition into pretty much what I'm doing now, which is CNC. And the whole reason I got into CNC was because of a miscommunication, which happened at this time. So I was looking to leave. And um, another thing I will add to those of you that may be looking, trying to find work for, you know, to, to get yourself some money during, during college is uh, go through temp agencies. I know they, I know people like to put them down for some reason. Like they, they say, Oh, if you go through a temp agency, you're like lower than lower class or something like that. I mean, that's what people have told me in the past. And it's really, you know, it gets on my nerves because that's not the case. I mean, all it is is that temp agencies are that bridge between you and the employer. Most times, almost every job I've gotten through a temp agency led to full-time employment. Now, don't get me wrong. There are also situations where you can just stick with the temp agency and just go from job to job if that's your thing. And, and it also, I think, depends on the type of work that you would be doing. But for me, I was always looking for full-time work. I never was looking for some kind of temporary business or, or what have you. So they, um, so I was talking with this particular temp agency that I work with actually to get the job I was already at. And they, they were asking me if I had machine experience. Now, what I interpreted that as was just a machine, any kind of machine, which I said, yes, I have machine experience. And I thought they were talking about something like um, at the saw chain place, they, they have a, like an automatic grinder. So you just feed the chain through and then it's, it stops at these intervals and sharpens the little teeth on the chain and, you know, moves it along. I thought they were talking about something like that. And so I said, yeah, I've worked on stuff like that before. Sure. Yeah, I have experience. And so they set me up with this job. I didn't even have to interview or anything. They just said, okay, well, we'll set you up with this place. You start Monday. And I was like, great. And and so I show up to this place Monday morning and and uh, the the super my supervisor, my new supervisor is walking me around and and he says, so oh, I guess I hear you got uh, CNC experience. And uh, the thing was, is that the last time, the only time I had ever done anything with CNC was, well, at that time, it was probably like five or six years ago. When I was in high school, my sophomore year, I took a, uh, uh, I took a, a, they, they called it a metals class. Um, but part of that was CNC learning, learning how to, we learned how to do like a really quick program. We, we basically, uh, carved our first, you know, the initial of our first name into like a piece of particle board, nothing, nothing fancy. Um, and I mean, the CNC machine itself was very, very small in CNC terms. I mean, I could fit it on top of my desk, which, you know, compared to your typical machines are, is just extremely tiny. Um, and then I had some manual lathe experience in that class and other stuff, did some welding. Um, but nothing, nothing too, uh, too detailed, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term right now. <laughs> um, but I mean, I only took that class for a semester and during that whole semester, we, we implemented different ways to work on metals. So it's not like we spent a lot of time working on any, any particular aspect. Um, so, I mean, when you break it all down, that whole section of CNC probably only lasted a couple of weeks at best. And so I'm telling the supervisor the same thing and he's like, well, Hmm. I guess we can start you, you know, on the simple stuff and see how you do with that. So basically he was giving me a shot. He was giving me a chance to, um, see, you know, see if I had what it took to, to work on CNC. And so he started me off with like this gear, I think he called it a gear hob, something like that. But basically is a, a very simple machine that just ground the, uh, notches into, into gears. Um, and it was, it was very dirty. It was very smelly. I pretty much smelled of oil all week long. And I think just by the time like Sunday rolled around when I finally got it all washed out, then I'd be going back to work and just starting it all over again. So it was a very nasty job. And I mean, when you work in manufacturing, usually it's going to be pretty dirty anyway. So, you know, I'm sure any of those of you out there listening that work in manufacturing, you know what I'm talking about. 
Um, but uh, basically, I slowly moved up to starting to work on some of the CNC lathes that they had there. But I was still only doing very simple work. Like it literally was just, here's the button to start the machine. Here's the button to stop it. Here's how you load it. The end. I mean, that's real, real basic, simple stuff. But I wanted to learn like the more technical aspects of it. I wanted to kind of get into it. I wanted to learn more. Um, but the problem was with that company is that they, you have to be like a certain level machinist to start doing that kind of stuff. And I was, I don't even think I was on the scale yet. Um, but I kept bugging my supervisor. I mean, almost daily. I was like, just show me how to do this. Show me how to do that. And eventually he did start to show me some of the stuff. Cause I was proving that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't breaking anything. Meanwhile, other newbies that came in like around the same time I did, they were, they were screwing up left and right. I'm not trying to put them down to put myself up. I'm just saying that's what happened. You know, I was just being more cautious and aware of, you know, what I was doing and they weren't. And basically in, in the world of CNC, you don't want to crash a machine. That's just a big, big, bad no, no. Um, and so that's pretty much the thing that I made sure I always avoided. And I still do that to this day. Um, but, uh, they eventually moved me out of CNC and moved me into the welding area because they needed, they needed someone to, to fill a spot that had recently become vacant. So I started training with this, you know, the, the head welder there and he liked the work I was doing and, and it eventually came time for me to, to, uh, well, the opportunity to get hired on permanent had become available and that spot was open. And so obviously he put in a word of recommendation. He's like, you should hire him. He's great. And blah, blah, blah. And, um, ultimately they decided not to hire me. They decided to go with someone brand new that had never touched welding equipment before and all this. So basically this poor guy had to retrain someone brand new. And I mean, I still talked to him afterwards cause then they moved me into another area and, and, uh, you know, he was just be like, Oh, this new guy is not doing, doing things right. And blah, blah, blah. And all this stuff. So, um, they basically told me at that point that I had to wait until another position became available. And I said, okay, well, when, when does that happen? They say it could be any time, could be next week, could be three months from now. And I said, I don't really want to do that. So I started looking for, you know, was back out on the market. And, uh, like I said, I'm not going to go through my entire resume. I'm just kind of, I mentioned, I went into a little more detail with that company because that's where, where it started for me with CNC and all that. Um, but I eventually got hired to another company that was a knife manufacturing company. And I spent a good chunk of time there about three and a half years. And that's where I learned a lot. I was satisfied with that aspect of the job, which was always learning something. If I went to work and I learned something that I didn't know the day before, I felt satisfied and accomplished. Um, but towards the end of that three and a half years, the learning kind of slowed down quite a bit. I mean, I'm not saying I became an expert, but just as far as like how things ran in the area that I worked in and I worked and I worked by myself because I was working on the night shift and they only needed one guy on the night shift. So when you're working by yourself, you got to start figuring out things on your own because there's no one to help you. And I not only figured out things for myself, but I started helping others as well. Like I started to become the support that I didn't have. And, you know, it eventually got to the point where I just wasn't learning anything anymore. I felt my pay could have been a little higher. And so without not really knowing what would happen. I just kind of threw my name out there. I started making a couple calls to like the usual places that I, that I knew of. And turns out that there was another place out there that wanted to hire me and, and pay me a little more. So, um, uh, before I get into that, I'll say that this, this place I was at, you know, for the three years was also where I started dabbling into programming. And I'm mentioning that because it'll apply, uh, to something a little bit later. Um, but this is where I started uh, working with programming, I actually took a course for a little while. And this was, this actually kind of relates to what I was saying earlier about, um, you know, mentioning your accomplishments and whatnot is because I didn't, I didn't talk about when I was taking this course and I could have, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure I was still social media was around at that time. Um, but I kept it to myself. I didn't, I didn't talk about it. I didn't want to talk about it. Um, 
And what ended up happening is I just started falling behind. It was just one class, one class. And I fell behind because I suffered greatly from procrastination. Now, mind you, and this is, this is also where I get into saying that when it's your time and your dime, then it's a little bit more important. This course was actually done through a, uh, it was through a voucher through my job. So essentially I didn't have to pay for the tuition, but I did have to pay for the book or the lab fee or something like that. I had to pay a very small fee for taking the class. So eventually I started looking at it as like, well, it didn't even cost me that much money and yeah, who cares? Um, and it was also dealing with uh, Mastercam, which is a very well-known uh, CAM program for, for uh, CNC. Um, but the company I worked at didn't work with Mastercam. They work with Gibbscam, which is completely different and blah, 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 blah. There are similarities that you can find, but you got to be pretty versed in programming in general to be able to, you know, go from one to the other and vice versa. Um, so eventually I just became, I just procrastinated too far and I couldn't keep up. And then I eventually just didn't bother with the class anymore. Um, and then I think a year later, then I left, uh, eventually left the job because there was another company that wanted to pay me more. And, you know, I figured I'd expand, expand my experience. And so I spent like another year and a half there. I started working on lathes at that point. Um, and like the, the progression at that time started to become when I felt I wasn't getting paid the wages I deserved, then I would start looking again. And I always lowballed myself because a lot of times when you're, when you're a machinist looking for work, you want to, you're looking for the highest pay possible. Like there was a guy I knew that he was only, he was making something like 15 an hour or something. And he was demanding that he make 18 an hour. And I kept telling him like, why don't you go for 16 an hour? Why don't you just try to increase it a little bit? An increase is still better than nothing. And so that was a strategy I, I implemented whenever I was looking for a new job was just bring it up a little bit higher than what I'm currently making. So it's an improvement to, you know, to me and my well being, and to the company, they're thinking like, wow, he only wants to earn that much. Sure. Yeah, we can totally do that. And this strategy worked um, because then I ended up leaving that job for another one. And I primarily left for this other job because because of the type of machinery I was going to be working on. And everyone was telling me late, well, in the CNC world, everyone's telling me that this particular type of machinery is one that you want to learn because these, uh, these particular type of machinists are in high demand because they're, there's not many that know how to operate these machines. Um, so I decided to go with that. And, uh, unfortunately they ended up letting me go, uh, about three months in, it was right before they were going to, uh, hire me permanent because typically uh, the process is that you get you go through a temp agency and then it's about 90 days or three months and then they'll the company will usually hire you on and at least in the past there's been no issues with that like they I've always hit my 90 days and they just they're okay you're hired sometimes it takes longer because the company will drag its feet and everything um, but I always end up getting hired so I wasn't worried about that this was the first time that the company actually decided not to hire me. Um, and it was just kind of a unfortunate circumstance um, because they they ended up letting another guy go because he just wasn't cutting it. And in the process of finding someone to replace him, they actually found two people that were uh, well qualified and they were both more qualified than even I was which I was still, you know, I was still brand new at this. So they decided that they were going to hire both of them and then let me go in the process. So, I mean, it was unfortunate. I don't hold any grudges that, you know, I'd have probably done the, done the same thing. Um, but then that actually led to me getting my new job. And now we're up to just a little over a year, two years ago. Um, when I was working at, um, what would end up being my last job in Oregon. Um, and that, I mean, if you were to line up all the jobs that I currently have and have worked, this is probably the, my most favorite or my, the, like, this was the best job that I considered to have had, not necessarily in terms of pay. Cause I actually make more now than I did working at that place, but it was the quality 
of what I was doing, which is why I keep reiterating that it's not going to be about how much money I make. It's going to be about what I'm doing as far as if I'm satisfied with my job or not. So I was working at this uh, particular place and um, this is where I started actually doing some programming because I mentioned to them, I was like, hey, I have some Mastercam experience. I see you use Mastercam here. What do you say about me maybe trying to do some programming? Because they put me on a lathe and there was only one uh, CNC lathe in there. And I was basically just replacing some some guy that had left. And the thing was, is that they didn't have a dedicated, because usually in CNC shops, unless you're in a particular type of shop, usually you're going to have a programmer that's, de that's a dedicated programmer. That's all they do. They just program for all the machines in the shop. But they only had one lathe, so they didn't bother having a, a programmer for that. And also because usually uh, lathes, are, lathes are the easiest to program, you can usually do it line by line, which basically means you're manually creating the code. Because if you think about it, you're just working on like a, a standard two-plane grid and you're just plotting points. So you're just saying, okay, tool, tip of tool, go from this point here to that point there. Like it, it's the same thing as if you're plotting points on a graph, um, like a line graph. If you plot them in a certain way, you end up making the shape of something. And that's pretty much all that lathe machining is. It can obviously get more technical and more complex, especially when you're bringing more axes into it. But in general terms, when you're only dealing with a two axis, this one, this particular one was a three axis. Um, then it, it, it's actually pretty simple and you can just do it pretty much by hand. Um, the guy that usually worked on the machine, he would just write the code out on, on a notepad and then he would just stand there for 20 minutes typing in all the code into the machine. And there you go. You had your program. Um, but I wanted to try seeing if I could use Mastercam to do it. And we had this project part that needed to get done. And, and I was at first trying to do everything, writing it line by line, which was just, taking forever um so that's when i asked him if i could try mastercam and then by the <laughs> so over the course of two weeks i took their they had like this training manual for for mastercam for lathe and i took that and pretty much kept it with me and that thing became my bible for the next two weeks and i eventually got the program ready to go and then when i started the program or when i was ready to actually run the part they ended up moving moving it to somewhere else which i ended up making my program kind of worthless but but the thing the important thing was is that i got a lot of experience working with mastercam during that time and so i asked him i said well would you have a problem if if i started just using mastercam to make all my parts i think i think in a short amount of time this can actually be faster than writing it line by line and i think the parts will be more accurate and they gave me the go ahead you know they said okay sure um so I also had a, a copy that I quote unquote acquired uh, at home as well. And so I would bring my work back and forth because I felt this was a good opportunity. Um, regardless of you know what I did at that particular company, I figured this would be good experience leading into future jobs should I choose to leave. Um, I actually was fine where I was. Um, I mean, in a way, looking back, I kind of wish I was still there, but, you know, compared to what I'm doing now, I'm kind of glad I didn't because, well, I'll, I'll talk about, I'll talk about why a little bit later, but, um, it's eventually I got to the point where thinking, thinking that maybe I could actually go for a programmer position at that company that I was already working at because they, um, in that time that I was there, they bought another lathe. Uh, another CNC lathe, and I started programming for that as well. Um, that one had a different person actually running the machine, but I was starting to kind of get, well, starting to kind of fit into this position where I was programming and running a machine. And so I felt this was kind of a big deal. And they eventually said, uh, no, you're not going to be, you're not going to be a programmer because you're not a programmer. We'll, we'll actually put a real programmer in that position should we ever choose to make one. So that was when that was the turning point. I mean, that you could say that that was the moment that ultimately led to me talking to you right now on this podcast, because because at that time, 
that's when I decided, okay, I, I want to be, become a programmer. And so I put my name out there just like I had in the past, um, put my name out there and just started talking, you know, to anyone who contacted me saying, this is what I'm looking to do. Same strategy, you know, would low ball them because I knew what programmers typically made and I just kept my, my fee underneath that. Um, the thing was, is that, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, I started getting more and more calls that were actually out of state that were for places that would require me to move in order to work there. And like, I kind of fought with this mentally for probably a few months. Um, but then in the end I decided that, well, maybe moving is a good, good idea. Um, and then you know, I mean, I was getting, I was getting calls for some really weird locations, like somewhere in the middle of Iowa or somewhere in the Northern tip of Virginia. And I would look at these places on a map and there, I mean, it's like the community and city was like built around this one company. And I'm not saying like, it's a huge company. I'm saying like, it's small, tiny, meaning if I didn't like the job, then I'd be stuck there or I'd have to move again you know, to who knows where in order to find something that I liked. So I said, okay, if I'm going to move, then I'm going to kind of be the master of my own destiny or whatever, and, and try and put some of my input into where I go. So I started isolating my searches to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, because that's, you know, when I made a list of places that I wouldn't, wouldn't mind moving to Milwaukee was at the top of my list. It fit in the climate that I liked, although I don't really like the summers here. Um, and, and I had friends here. That was pretty much the easy decision for me. Cause I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have gone to Virginia cause I don't like the climate there and I don't know anyone there. Um, same with Florida. Well, actually Florida, I do know some people there, but sorry, Floridians. I'm not ever going to live in Florida. No, no way. I visited the Orlando area for five days. Hopefully that's the only five days I'll ever spend there. Cause it was just, I was miserable. It was the middle of, it was the middle of May and it was like 90 degrees with 125,000% humidity. It was just gross. It, I hated it. I mean, as, as much as I may ever gripe about, uh, the humidity here in Wisconsin, Florida was way worse, way, way, way worse. I don't know how you guys do it down there. It's just crazy. But, uh, anyway, so getting back to what I was doing. Um, so that was the point where I, where I decided to move. And I eventually found this, you know, potentially promising job. Um, granted, I had to do everything over the phone. So it's not like I could walk in the shop or talk in person with, you know, the, the, the owner or manager or whatever and see, kind of see how things ran. I just had to sort of do, do uh, what do they call that? A blind sale or something. Um, but I essentially just had to accept the job in the hopes, in the hopes that, you know, it would work out for me. And, uh, and this guy, <laughs> what he was looking, he was looking for sort of an all in one kind of position. Cause originally I was, look I was obviously looking for a programmer. So programmer was listed in there, but he had a whole bunch of other duties as well. Like he wanted, he basically, the way he worded it to me is that he wanted, he wanted to find his number two cause he was the owner and it was a small shop. So it was pretty much like the owner still did a lot of work on the floor. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't like the type of guy that was sitting in an office somewhere with his feet propped up, not doing anything. Um, he still had to get out there and do work. He did usually most of the deliveries and everything. Um, but he was looking for his number two, you know, the, the, the person that would eventually like supervise the whole shop, but they would have other duties as well, including even running a machine. Um, so I was like, okay, that sounds like growth potential. Um, the pay was, the pay was a dollar less than what I was making at my current place in Oregon. And I should mention, um, I actually want to mention like the, the amounts that I was making, I should have been doing this from the beginning. Um, and the reason, the reason I want to mention that is because I think it'll be more impactful when I talk about, um, what I'm working towards with, with school and everything. Um, because it, uh, when I started, well, when I started working at the saw chain place, I was making $10 an hour. And I think I made the same thing when I got my first CNC job. Um, and then 
at the knife place, I, I made $11 an hour, but I think I left there making 1450 or something. So I got a pretty decent amount of raises in there. Most of it was because of a, well, I'm not going to get into it, but basically, um, you know, it was more like legislation that led to me making 14 an hour as opposed to doing a good job or anything like that. Um, cause I didn't get along with one of my bosses there either. And so he, he begrudgingly had to give me that raise. Like he was literally gritting his teeth as he was like, you get 14 an hour, you know? Um, and then when I left that job, I left that job to make 16 an hour at the next place. And then at the, uh, very short job that I was at, I was making 17 with the potential, well, with the promise to make 18 upon getting hired on. And, uh, and I, I got let go. So I was still only making 17. And the next place where I was doing the programming and starting to do the programming stuff, I was working at 17. And then I eventually did get hired on and I uh, got another dollar added on to my wages, which was pretty nice. So I was making, I was making 18 an hour at this point. So I'm talking to this guy over the phone about a job that I'm not going to be able to see until I'm already there. And he's, he's offering 17 an hour with obviously the potential for growth and raises and all that. And so I decided just to kind of take a chance, you know, like a leap of faith. Um, they said, I didn't really have a lot of faith, but I, at this point I believed I had to believe in myself that no matter what, whether this job worked out or not, that I was going to be able to, you know, figure, figure things out. And, you know, so I, I accepted. And, uh, then I, that left me with about a month to get ready and, and move. Um, so I left, left the job I was at and eventually did the, uh, the move to Wisconsin. So now we're at about a year ago, just a little over a year ago. And, I'm working at this new job now and I'm supposed to be like the programmer supervisor thing. But the thing is, is that he ultimately wanted a programmer that just programmed at the machine and was very, very against me using Mastercam. Um, and it turns out this guy was not really pro technology to begin with. Like this guy didn't have proper internet. He didn't, I mean, he had a phone line and pretty much did everything. He didn't do anything online. He, he was one of those people that like figured that, uh, you know, doing anything online was going to get you into trouble and things like that. Um, so I was trying to coerce him into, you know, seeing like, Hey, you know, the internet's not really that bad of a place if you know where to go. Um, and was trying to get him to work on the side of technology and he just wasn't having any of it. Um, so eventually that eventually like going to that job, granted, thankfully it only lasted a month. Um, but man, every day just felt like I was going, it felt like I was going to prison for eight hours and I had, cause I mean, you know, to me, that's what my jobs feel like is that you go to prison for eight or 10 hours, however long you're doing it. And it's not until you're released that you actually feel free, you know, which I think a lot of people can relate on you know, with their jobs, it doesn't have to be manufacturing, but any job that you work in kind of feels like a prison cell. And my advice to you would be, if it does feel that way, then do something about it. You know, that's what, that's what I'm doing. I mean, to think, to think that I would have to work in CNC until I was old and gray and retired just makes me want to, I mean, it, it basically takes out my will to live. I don't want to, I don't want to live that kind of life. Um, now that's not to say I'm, you know, suicidal or anything. Um, but that's, that's just like the mindset that I was in for a very long time is I just, I didn't see the point when this is all I was going to do day to day. Um, now don't get me wrong. Like people, people in the, there are people in this line of work that absolutely love the job. They love it. They, some even went to school for it. Um, which I mean, if that's your thing, you know, if you, like the idea of like working with your hands and getting dirty and, you know, doing some technical stuff on the side and not having to deal with customers, then maybe manufacturing would be a route for you. I mean, at this point, so I guess I'll, I'll speed up, um, and get back to, uh, get back to, oh man, I just saw the clock tick over again. I hope that didn't cause a pause. Anyway, I'll, I'll deal with that later. Um, but so, uh, 
So I left that job and eventually got a job uh, working else, working at another place. And I was making 21 an hour, which I thought was awesome. I mean, that's the highest pay that I've made yet. And, you know, I was thinking like, okay, well, you know, I mean, the guy said that there was potential to, to do programming and stuff. Cause that's what I still tried to keep an eye out for. Um, but, uh, ultimately that ended up not being the case because during that time I decided I was going to go to school and I went to my supervisor and I told him this cause he was, he had a chat with me like, uh, like three and a half weeks into the job saying like, yeah, we're going to get you more training and blah, blah, blah. And, and I, I basically just told him, I was like, you don't, you shouldn't bother with getting a lot of training on me. I mean, train me to do what I need to do, but don't invest in me as if I'm going to be like working here for the next 40 years. Cause that's not going to happen. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to, at the time I decided I was going to do it. So I was, I was like, I, I'm going to, I'm going to go to school, do IT, you know, at best, I'll probably be here like two years and then I'm going to move on to something else. And he caught me off guard. He, he got me because he said, well, maybe you should just leave right now. And that wasn't an offer. That was, that was basically him telling me that I was fired. And so, yeah, he canned me. And I mean, that's, that's the thing that probably pisses me off most about my line of work is that. And I mean, I, I kind of get it even where I'm at now is that, is that, uh, if you're, if you're not committing and saying, I'm going to work here forever, then there's, there's going to be bad things that will happen in this particular case. I got fired because I didn't say forever to this guy, um, where I'm at now, I make, now I make 20 bucks an hour. So I'm still making a good wage and essentially all that extra money that's not going towards like bills and, and, you know, paying off my car and insurance and stuff like that is going towards tuition. So don't think that because I'm making 20 bucks an hour that I'm just rolling in money. Now, don't get me wrong. 20 bucks an hour is a good living. I mean, I think that's just under 40 grand a year, which is the typical average pay of a lot of, you know, your, your average person. Um, of course, you know, you can do, do different jobs and make more money and so on and so forth. And that's one of the reasons I went into it is because I saw that, you know, you could end up making twice what I'm making now. Um, insert filler audio here. Okay. Sorry, everyone. I'm afraid that this show is going to be a little janky. Um, it's, I'm having trouble with my recorder. So I tried to, um, I tried, uh, bringing the quality down. Uh, that my recorder records at because I was experimenting with the podcast to try and record at a higher quality. And I'm thinking that maybe it's causing some, some uh, issues with it continuing to record. So um, we'll hopefully have that all resolved by the next episode, but I had to actually stop um, because I got stung by a bee. Um, I know that sounds weird, but uh, it turns out, I think I have a hive uh, in the corner of my building and I live on the second floor. So, uh, pretty much on a daily basis, I see bees flying around, usually only one or two, but one in it ended up getting, uh, on the floor and was crawling around. And I, in fact, uh, came into contact with him with my foot and he stung me right on my toe. Um, thankfully I'm okay. I'm not uh, allergic to bees or anything. Um, but you know, my toe was obviously a little tender. Um, so to be honest, I have no idea where I left off. I don't know where the audio ended because that's when my recorder kind of cut out. Um, but uh, hopefully I kind of got the gist of, of my work history out to you guys. Uh, I mean, uh, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to write in um, and I'll be happy to answer them. Like I'm, I'm pretty much making myself an open book here. Like I'm a, I'm almost like a guinea pig or, or the experiment as far as getting getting this information out to you guys so that you can, um, hopefully relate, you know, and be able to share your own stories as well. So we're just going to, I'm, I'm going to be done with the, um, with the work history. I think I bored you enough with that. So I'm very quickly going to go into the Japan note for today, which should be pretty quick and painless. Um, uh, and I want to add that if you have anything, um, that you would like, uh, discuss as far as the Japan note goes, because this is not just me trying to teach you what to know. I'm, 
teach you what I know, I should say. Um, I'm looking to learn along the way as well. So, you know, there'll be some, some days I'll probably talk about uh, a particular word and I'm going to be looking for words that are in common Japanese that uh, maybe I don't know. And of course, like I mentioned, if there's a word that you want to know about or pronunciation of something or whatever, you can write in and I will do my absolute best. And if you're, if you're a native speaker listening to this, you're definitely more than welcome to correct anything that I may get wrong. Cause I, I will say it every episode. I am not an expert. I'm not fluent. I'm not any of that. I'm just, I am a learner like most, uh, most beginning Japanese students. Um, but I'm hoping that I can implement it into my future career. So I do want to learn what I can along the way. And hopefully you'll be willing to, willing to do that with me. So, so today, uh, last time I talked about the pronunciation of the R sounds, uh, um, today I'm going to talk about the F sounds, which, uh, I honestly should have looked this up beforehand, but, um, as I, as I had mentioned, there are symbols that you can put next to the hiragana and katakana to, um, alter how they sound. So, um, what we're working with here is the H sounds. So it's ha, hi, hu, he, ho, and you're putting, uh, you're putting the little, the little degree symbol next to it. I don't know what it's actually called. So I apologize for making it sound so primitive, but, um, that symbol changes the H into, oh, you know what? I actually got that wrong. <laughs> I totally got that wrong. It's actually the quotation marks symbol. The, the degree symbol changes it into a P sound. Um, but the, the quotation marks changes it into an F sound. So it goes from ha, hi, hu, he, ho to fa, hi, fu, fe, fo. And I know I sound a little weird when I pronounce that, which is what I'm going to talk about. Um, when you're, when you're doing the F sounds, um, they are very similar to the H sounds in, in Japanese. Um, basically what the, again, this is just the way I was taught. And I'm not claiming that this is the way to do it. Um, so, you know, definitely do uh, whatever outside research you wish, you know, um, look, like I said, you know, we're in the age of YouTube, so you can easily look up native speakers saying, you know, speaking the language and just look for those, for those F sounds where they are. Um, but uh, when you're pronouncing your F sounds, you kind of want to, it's almost like a combination, just like the, the R sounds was. Um, you're wanting to, to kind of combine your H sound, your H, huh, and then combine it with an F sound with the F. So you're, you're almost kind of breathing out the F sound. That's the easiest way I can explain it. So you're going like F. Um, and it, it is hard to explain. And I mean, obviously if you can find information of, you know, someone natively speaking this, it might make more sense to you, but that's, that's the way that I learned how to do it. Um, and I mean, obviously in speaking, you're probably going to, you're probably going to make more of an F sound anyway. Um, but this is just a way to, um, try to sound, you know, a little bit more, more like a native. And of course, you know, if you're, if you're able to speak, you know, if you're able to talk directly with a native, then, you know, that should be even better. I mean, they, they, obviously we'll know how to properly, properly say things. So, you know, go for that. Um, I don't know if I'm going to do any more pronunciation, uh, notes. I, I don't, I don't know if, I really don't know if I'm doing them justice. I think, I think I'd be better off just doing like, uh, vocabulary or something like that. Um, cause that's, that's usually a bit easier to explain. I can use it in a sentence, so on and so forth. Um, and that's honestly what I really need to work on is expanding my vocabulary. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's the note for today is, is the, uh, the F sounds. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to also put these in the show notes. So I'm actually going to create or not create, but I'm going to, um, do a copy paste of the actual Kana so that you can, uh, see what they look like. Um, and the only, the only difference you're going to notice is just a little modifier, uh, in the upper, it'll be on the upper right corner of the actual Kana itself. Um, that's all this making, you know, changing it from the H sound to the F sound. Um, so that's what you got to look for. And with the H's, they have, it has two modifiers. So one, one will change it to the F sounds. The other will change it to a P sounds. So you got to 
you got to be on the lookout for that. But uh, yeah, next time I'm probably going to, I don't know what I'll talk about. Maybe I'll talk about uh, like, uh, like greetings or something. Um, you know, just start with the basics. Start with the real, real simple stuff. And then, then we can maybe work on some, some of the more intermediate or even advanced stuff if I'm able to learn it and, you know, know, know what I'm, maybe hopefully know what I'm talking about. I don't know. We'll have to, we'll have to wait and see on that. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's pretty much going to do it for this episode. Um, if you, if you so choose to get in touch with the show, you, there are a couple ways you can do that. You can send a, send a old fashioned letter to email at the road to Japan.com. You can also look up the show on Facebook, just search for the road to Japan, or you can tweet at the road to Japan. Uh, those are probably the three easiest ways to get in touch with the show. Um, I suppose if you want, you can try and seek me out personally, but just getting in the touch with the show will be a lot better. Um, next week, I haven't decided what I'm going to talk about, but I do have a list of show ideas. Um, let's see. I can actually just pull that up real quick. This is going to make for great audio. Future show ideas. Uh, what do I want to talk about? What are we going to... I think next time I'm going to talk about... I think I'm going to talk about the things that I'm looking forward to once I'm once I'm in Japan. Like the things the things that I'm excited about. I mean, yes, you know, obviously I'll be excited about living in Japan, but um, these are like going to be some of the more detailed points about that. Um, so yeah, you can look forward to that. Um, once again, I thank you very much for listening. Hopefully... Hopefully I'm getting better at this. Um, I'm, I'm a little rusty in my in my in my podcasting ways. So uh, hopefully this will just get better as time goes on. But uh, for now, this has been episode three of the Road to Japan. My name is Nico. Thank you for listening. Minasan, san gambate.